Joseph. It was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call, they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not know her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. The vision. Joseph receives a vision as he finds himself in a bit of a conundrum, a bit of a challenging situation. He receives a vision. In a time of certain confusion, Joseph receives a vision. Perhaps Joseph was entangled in one of the most problematic situations in his lifetime, but Joseph received a vision. You see, Joseph was the earthly father of Jesus. Some other things we know about Joseph throughout the scripture is that he was a carpenter by trade, according to Matthew chapter 13 and 55. He was a carpenter. He was a woodworker built furniture and things of that nature. He was probably alive at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, but probably dead at the end of his ministry. The Bible tells us that he was a descendant from the house of David. But one of the most important things we know about Joseph, which there is little concerning him throughout the scriptures is that he was by the account given by Matthew verse 19 of chapter 1 that he was a righteous man the word righteous means to be just to be virtuous to be good to be moral an extended definition of our understanding a truer understanding of the word righteous means to be in right standing with God. See, there is a form of righteousness amongst men, but there is a true righteousness with God. So within the body of Christ, we believe that righteousness can only completely be established or described or find its full meaning in the fact that you are in right standing with God. So this man, Joseph, from the house of David, from the lineage of David, a royal lineage, in, in fact, was himself a righteous man. He was moral. He was good. He was virtuous. And as we see and read the account here, the Bible speaks to his righteousness. The Bible said that he did not know Mary until she had given birth to this son, Jesus. In other words, even though he was engaged to this maiden, they had not known each other intimately until the appropriate time. 
he honored this his would-be wife, his betrothed. And we'll see here in the text is that he honored her beforehand because he, after receiving this news of her pregnancy, that she had been with child, the Bible said that he contemplated some things, but yet in the end, he did the right thing. The Bible said that Joseph the Bible lets us know that he was a person of character and he was a person of commitment, which leads me to our first point of the day. Joseph was engaged. Verse 18 tells us that now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. Matthew is given an account, a narrative of Jesus's birth and life. It said that his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. A betrothal is an engagement. To be betrothed is a promise to marry. In fact, it is an, it is an contractual agreement. The betrothed, the betrothal or the engagement usually lasted for about a year. Before you marry someone, you should take some time getting to know them. Before you rush into a marriage with, with someone, you should spend some time collecting a little information about them. There are some things you should know. You want to know some things about them. You want to know a little bit about their family history. You want to spend enough time with them so that you can see uh, 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 the various aspects of who they are. Friends, you do understand that oftentimes when we get into a dating relationship with someone, the person that we eventually will spend our time with is not necessarily the real person. When we're dating, we get to meet that person's agent that representative, we see the best parts of who they are. All of their faults and vices are hidden from view. Everybody wants to put their best foot forward during the dating period. An engagement period is a time that we ought to learn about the person. The time that we ask the difficult questions that are going to be pertinent to a lasting and fulfilling marriage. I certainly believe that part of the problem with quote unquote marriages today is that people don't spend the necessary time laying the foundation for a kingdom marriage. People often spend more time planning the wedding than they do planning the marriage. You spend more time choosing what colors we're going to wear, who the, who the seating chart for the reception. You know that Uncle Willie can't sit next to your Auntie Susie. <laughs> you know that's going to be a problem. They both have strong personalities. You people will spend more time trying to figure out the seating arrangements than they do spending on how they're going to manage the finances or how they're going to rear the children, the things that are important for a lasting relationship. The Bible said that Joseph honored this time. He honored this time in the fact that he had not been intimate with his would-be wife. He did not say, well, you know, we're engaged now. We can go ahead and do what we want to do. He understood that there was a time for engagement. There was a time to express the commitment, but that commitment had not yet become covenant. You see, the betrothal uh, would last for at least a year. It was a time of commitment, but not yet covenant. It showed that Joseph was in a committed relationship, not only with Mary, but he was in a committed relationship with God. Friends, young people in particular, 
those considering marriage, those who desire to be married one day if you're not already, let me encourage you to be committed not only to that person, but to be committed to God. You see, it was his commitment with God or to God that transcended even his commitment to Mary. It is that commitment to God that will keep us out of trouble. It is that commitment to God that will keep us in the righteousness of God. That commitment with God, with God is what will allow us to uphold the moral standard of God. It's the commitment with God that will allow us to stand on the absolute truth of God. I wish I had some help this morning. Joseph was in a committed relationship. And the fact that he was committed to Mary and committed to God opened him up to receive that which would become the covenant. You see, the news that Joseph received only came after the commitment was made. It came after the commitment was made, but before the consummation. You see, covenants, my friend, and this is what we need to understand about the marital relationship. The marital relationship represents a covenant. It represents two becoming one. It represents a transformation in our very being. See, covenants are established once commitments are made. Mm -hmm. The wedding comes after the engagement. The engagement is the promise to marry. The engagement is the agreement. The engagement is the commitment. My friends, when a young man petitions a young woman to marry them and the young woman says yes, that is a commitment that is being made. And it is sealed with the ring. I wish I had somebody to help me out this morning. Listen, God was looking for someone who, was who would be committed to care for his only begotten son. He was looking for someone that was committed, that demonstrated the proper characteristics in order for him to entrust them with his most valuable possession, his only begotten son. He was, lo he was looking for someone that would be able to care for Jesus Christ, who would be able to, to, to take him seriously and to represent him as his earthly father. He was looking for someone who was committed to care for his begotten son, his only begotten son, the one who would firmly establish his kingdom. See, this is a precursor of who we are to be. We ought to be caretakers of God's kingdom. We ought to be caretakers. We ought to be ones who are committed to the taking care of God's kingdom agenda. We ought to be the ones who are demonstrate the level of commitment to God and to others. You shall love the Lord your God and you shall love your neighbors. We ought to be committed to the great commandment which is to love God and to love others. We ought to be committed as Joseph was. Joseph was committed to the great commandment because he was committed to God and he was committed to Mary. That was a demonstration of his character, letting God know that he could be trusted with the care of his son who would be the savior of all the world. See, friends, we, God is looking for someone who is willing to stay engaged. Friends, once you get engaged, you need to stay engaged. And engagement means someone who is an active participant, someone who is actively involved. Look at somebody say, get engaged and stay engaged. Look at somebody else say, get engaged and stay engaged. Friends, we need more believers who are willing to stay engaged in the activity of advancing God's kingdom in the activity of caring for what God has entrusted us with. And that's what Joseph represents. Joseph represents not only a person who was engaged, but he represents a man who was engaged. Listen, surely Joseph was challenged, as we'll see in a couple of minutes. He was challenged in a way that most men 
would, call, would cause most men to crumble. Friends, we need to stay engaged and we need to press in to our relationship with God. And this is what Joseph demonstrates for us. Joseph was engaged. Number two, Joseph had a dream. Because of Joseph's engagement, because of Joseph's commitment, the Bible said that Joseph now received a dream. The Bible said in verse 20 of chapter 1 of Matthew that while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, what were the things that he was thinking about? Well, if we go back a couple of verses, we see that his wife-to-be, his young maiden, who he had not known, who he had not been intimate with, was pregnant with child. Now, you have to step into Joseph's shoes and realize that Joseph was a real person. Joseph was a real man. <laughs> Joseph was an actual uh, a person in history. He was a real dude, okay? So step into Joseph's shoes for just a minute and imagine yourself being a real person. Imagine yourself being a real man and you're engaged to this young, beautiful woman, but you find out that she's pregnant by somebody else. You have just committed your life to her, your, ever, your everlasting love to her. You promised to marry her and spend the rest of your life together with her, but you find out that she's pregnant with someone else's child. Friends, I, I, I don't know about you, but that would be a challenging situation to find yourself in. That would be a very difficult situation to get past. So the Bible said that Joseph, dealing with this situation, he makes a plan. He makes a plan. He, he did not want to disgrace her publicly. The Bible said that Joseph was looking out for her best interests even in this. That upon hearing this news, upon having, uh, I would imagine that he felt a little disheveled. I would imagine that he felt that his life, his dreams were being shattered. Because after all, I have not known this woman, but she is with child. I imagine that Joseph has some things run through his mind as any man would. What are people going to think? What are going to be the ramifications of this? What are going to be the repercussions of this? This doesn't look good. This doesn't look good that we're going to show up to the wedding and she's going to have a bump in her belly. <laughs> this, doesn't, this doesn't look good. <laughs> uh, uh, it doesn't look right. We, we're going to deal with a lot of shame. Uh, 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 people are going to throw shade at us. People are going to uh, 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 think that we did something wrong. Uh, so what Joseph decides in his mind as he's going through this, just as a real person from a real perspective, friends, you got to understand that we are human. We have human emotions. We have human reactions to the things that we go through. But let me encourage you that we shouldn't let you, we should not allow our emotions to lead us. We should not allow our emotions to lead in us making our decisions. Our decisions, hopefully, are to be spirit-led and not emotionally led. But Joseph, probably in his feelings, begins to come up with a plan. He said, I got to break this commitment because after all, it would be my legal due, it would be my uh, 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 legal, I will be legally able to do this having found that this woman is pregnant, I will be within my rights to annul this relationship before it even gets started. I will be, in, I will be within my rights to walk away from this because after all, it appears as though the promise has been broken by this young lady I was set to marry. But even in that, he cared for Mary in saying that he did not want to make a public spectacle of her. He didn't want, desire to go on Facebook and blast her out and out her 
about this. He didn't want to make a public announcement, talk to all his friends and all the people about, man, she did me wrong. You know, she pregnant, right? And it ain't mine. You know, uh, he didn't want to take her on Jerry Springer or the Maury show to find out <laughs> a DNA test. He, he didn't want to make a public spectacle of her. So he reasoned within himself. The Bible said he reasoned within himself. He thought within himself that, that maybe I'll just divorce her secretly. Maybe I'll just slide out the back door so as to avoid any heartache or any public spectacle. But the Bible said at that moment, an angel appeared. At that moment, the angel appeared in a dream. Joseph like his great, great, great uncle, had a dream. There's another dreamer named Joseph, and his account is given to us in Genesis chapter 37. This Joseph is in the lineage of the current Joseph. He is his great, 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 I don't know how many greats, but he's his great uncle. The Bible says, tells us in Genesis chapter 37 that that Joseph was also a dreamer. He said he lived in the land where his father stayed, the land of Canaan. There, these are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilah and Ziphlah, uh, and Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than the other sons because Joseph was the son born to him in the old age and he made a robe of many colors for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak, speak peaceably to them. Then Joseph had a dream, verse 5 of chapter 37 of Genesis, that when he was told of his brothers, when he, when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. They were, there we were binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly my sheaf stood up and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. Are you really going to reign over us, his brothers asked him? Are you really going to rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun, moon, and 11 stars were bounding down to him. He told it to his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this that you have had, he said? Am I and your mother and your brothers really going to come down and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in is mine. We're talking about two Josephs who are dreamers. And there are some similarities in their dreams. Number one, both of them had dreams of greatness. The dreams that they received were great. Number two, both dreams would make them the subject of ridicule, a judgment. Joseph's dream about this child that his would-be wife would carry would bring about a certain level of ridicule and judgment from his peers and from those in the community. Joseph in Genesis 37, his dreams brought about the hatred, the jealousy of his brothers. Both dreams would stir up a degree of violence. Joseph, because of these dreams that he shared with his brothers, found himself thrown into a pit, eventually into a prison, but ultimately led him to a palace. Both dreams would, dis would dislodge them from their current comfortable surroundings. Listen, when God gives you a dream or a vision, they are going to bring about a certain degree, a level of uncomfortable, uh, of comfort in your life. It, the dreams of God, the visions of God are going to make you uncomfortable or are going to dislodge you from your comfortable state of being. Listen, there was a difference in these dreamers. 
Primarily, the difference is that one decided to share his dream. One decided out of his youthful uh, inexperience to go out and actually publicize his dream. He went out and told his brothers. He went out. He was a little braggadocious. The picture I get of Joseph the, the dreamer was that he was a little bit he was a little bit spoiled. If we read the in the context of 37, we see that his father favored him and he had a special coat of many colors. His father favored him not only because of his old age, which is said here, but he was also the son of the wife, Rachel, who was, as you read the account, was the, the wife that he probably favored the most among his other wives. And you have to read the account to kind of see how all that uh, unfolded, okay? He was his favorite. <laughs> he was the son of his favorite baby mama, <laughs> to put that in modern uh, colloquialism. So this day, this Joseph, Joseph who was in betrothed to Mary, he chose the opposite. He chose not to go public. He chose not to, to brag, up, to, to go out and tell folks about it. He did not have a pity party, though he certainly could have. He could have called all his friends. He could have called all of his family members. He could have taken her to the public square even. It would have been his legal right to out her, to, to, to say, listen, I promised to marry this woman and now she's pregnant with somebody else's child. He chose not to go public. He decided to ponder on these things. And while he was pondering, the Bible said the Lord sent him a vision. The Bible said he was not wanting to make her a public example. You see, Joseph had considered divorce which would have been within his rights under Jewish laws, he considered abortion. Now, not abortion in the sense that we come to know abortion, but he considered aborting the plan of God. He considered walking away from destiny. He considered forfeiting the promise. He considered throwing in the towel. He considered giving up. He considered abandoning the situation. This was all within his rights, with all within his natural inclination to do. But in, in the end, he demonstrates a level of mercy and compassion. The mercy and compassion of a good, good father. The mercy and compassion of the father who resides in heaven. He demonstrates this mercy and compassion in this, verse 21 tells us that the angel spoke to Joseph and gave him a bigger vision, gave him a greater plan, one that he had not fully comprehended. He said, now, don't worry, don't be afraid, Joseph, for the woman is with child, that's the truth, but this child was given to her by the Holy Spirit. This child is not the, your ordinary child. This woman is not an ordinary woman. This is not an ordinary pregnancy. This child is to be birthed by the Holy Spirit. She had conceived not by another man so that you should be feeling shameful or feeling betrayed but her conception is from the Holy Spirit himself, from God himself. She has conceived in her womb. We talked about the womb last week. She has conceived in her prepared place for the promise of God by God's spirit. And she will give birth to a son. And watch this. And you have a role to play in this, Joseph. You have a role to play in this, the, the messenger says. And you shall name him. She will conceive, but Joseph, you are to name him. Now, there's supreme significance in that. And we'll get to it in just a moment. 
She shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus simply means Jehovah is salvation. The prophecy is fulfilled. Verse 23, the prophecy of Isaiah was said, see, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel. Listen, the authentication of God's word is the most profound, most profoundly verified through fulfillment of prophecy. I'll say that once again. The authentication of God's word is most profoundly demonstrated by the fulfillment of prophecy. What did, what did you say, Pastor Chuck? Those are a lot of big words. What I'm saying is the reason we know the word of God is true, the best evidence we have for the truth of God's word is that the prophecy of his word comes to pass. The things that it says will happen, happens. And we have lived long enough and we are currently living in the age, even right now, that we are seeing prophecy being fulfilled. We're seeing end time prophecy being fulfilled. Even the state of being that we are in currently at this moment, having church virtually like we are right now, is fulfillment of the prophetic vision of the word of God. So what it says here is that what this is, is a fulfillment of God's prophecy through the prophet Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 7 through 9. And it says in, chapter, in, in Isaiah chapter, chapter 9, let me go there, let's, let's read it. So we can see the fulfillment of prophecy being uh, 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 manifesting right here in the verse. Isaiah chapter 9 says, verse 6, it's the Christmas season. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Fire, Father, Prince of Peace, the dominion will be vast and his prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness for now and forever. The zeal of the Lord's army will, will accomplish this. So that is the prophetic vision, the prophetic announcement of the coming Savior. The prophetic announcement of Jehovah is salvation. Jesus, the Christ, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Remember last week we said in order to save us, God came beside us. He came with us in order to deliver us. And that's what the incarnation represents. So Joseph was engaged. Joseph had a dream. And last point, Joseph made a decision. Friends, let me encourage you this morning and let me make it clear. God can give you as many visions as he wants to, but until you make a decision about the vision, it will not manifest in your life. The Bible said when, jo when, when Joseph woke up, verse 24, he did as the Lord angel had commanded him, and he married the virgin. See, there's a difference, my friends, between a vision and a dream. A vision is a dream that is acted upon when you are awake. <laughs> now, I know in life you deal with a lot of people with a lot of dreams, a lot of things that they want to do, they desire to do, a lot of things that they are going to do. But until you act on it, it will never become truly a vision. It would only remain a dream, a daydream, in fact. Well, I want to do this. I, I'm thinking about doing that. I might start a business. I may start a ministry. I, you know, dream, 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 dream. But until we make a decision and act upon it, until we wake up and begin to act out the dream, in full awareness, in real life, the dream will only be a dream. The Bible said when Joseph woke up, when he came out of the trance, 
when he was fully aware and awake, the Bible said he did as the Lord angel had commanded him. And he took the woman as his beloved bride. See, a vision always requires a decision. Friends, stop saying what you're going to do and start doing it. Step out on faith. Walk out the dream that God has invested in you. Live it out. Accomplish it. Set out to achieve the things that God has implanted in you. Water that seed. Cause it to grow and see it manifest in your life. The Bible says that Joseph woke up and he acted upon that which he believed to be true. Joseph did not make an emotional decision that he wanted to. He was tempted to follow his emotional response. Emotional responses will only get us into trouble. Just this past week, a couple of days ago, I was driving, headed over to Lowe's, and I came upon a single car accident in the middle of the street. And I pulled over to assist, and it was a young couple, a very young couple, probably in late teens, early 20s, couldn't be no more than 19 or 20 years old. The young lady was driving and had apparently hit the uh, median and caused some damage to her car to the point that uh, the car was unable to mow. I got out to kind of help them get the car out of the middle of the road so that the traffic uh, can get by. Uh, then I noticed uh, her front rotor had been broken. I had never seen anything like that. The, the brake rotor inside the, the drum, the wheel drum of her car the front, on the front left side had been broken in, in a way, and it was protruding out to the point where the car couldn't, couldn't move. But the young lady was distraught. She was disheveled. She was, in many ways, she was... Uh, 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 inconsolable. She was crying and going about it. It was kind of interesting. Got the, the the young man, her boyfriend. He was he was just cool and just kind of chilling and kind of seeing it. But she was, oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I just got this car fixed. I paid money. My mom was gonna be mad and all this stuff. And I was just trying to to, to just kind of minister to her and and just kind of talk to her. I was just telling her, you know what? Thank God you know, you're okay. And she, she, I asked her what happened, and she said, well, well, we were having a fight. We were arguing in the car, and, and he tried to get out. <laughs> and so I just sped up. And, <laughs> and then she hit the thing. I said, I was like, wait a minute. He was trying to get out the car while the car was moving. That was fine. So, 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 so what it boiled down to, the, lady, the young lady had, had gotten into her emotions, and she wrecked her car. And now she was inconsolable, and she was going off, and, and I was trying to, you know, and of course, you know, I was trying to, trying to calm her down and, and let her know. And she said, and she said well, 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 how would you react? You know, I can't tell my mom. My mom's going to be mad. And how would you react if your daughter uh, 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 did something like this? And first I thought, I said, well, how old do you think I am? You know, she, she let me know that, that I was old. And, 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 but then I, then I said, you know what? If my daughter had, had, had gotten to an accident like this, first and foremost, I would, I would, I would be thankful that she didn't get hurt. And, and then I'd be thankful that she didn't hurt somebody else. And I would be thinking, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be thinking about the car. The damage to the car would not be my first concern about the situation. And, and, and she began to calm down a little bit. And I, and I just get to talk, so she said, just kept reminding her. She said, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. And I, and I just kept telling her, I said, the good news is that you will go home. But we got to get your car out of the road. But you will go home. That's, that's the good news, that you are going home. Because this could be a lot worse. The reason I share that with you all is because that was an example of what can happen when we allow our emotions to lead. Emotions can make us irrational. Emotions could, could cause us to abort the vision of God in our lives. And Joseph was tempted to react emotionally to this news that his wife-to-be 
was pregnant by someone else. But in his faithfulness, in his commitment, in his demonstration of mercy and compassion upon Mary, God used the situation that seemed to be bleak and gloom. He used the situation to cause his greatest glory to be revealed. And Moses and Joseph embraces the plan of God instead of aborting the plan of God. He embraces it. He embraces the responsibility. The Bible said that she will be that the virgin will conceive to you a son. And watch this. And Joseph, you are to name him Jesus. Now, there is great significance in Joseph naming the child. There's a great significance because in Jewish customs, as even uh, today, the custom is that the father names the children. It was the job or the role of the father to give the child the name because the, in, that, in that time, names meant something. When we name our children, they should have meaning. They should have a meaning that speaks to their purpose, a meaning that speaks to their destiny, a meaning that is a, that, that is a declared blessing over their life. We saw this with Elizabeth and Zechariah. The, the, you know, the Bible said they waited on Zechariah to give the, give the boy a name. And Zechariah said he shall be called John. They wanted, they wanted him to name him Zechariah the <laughs> second. Read the account in Luke chapter 1 and 2. You'll see. They wanted him to name, well, name Matthew. But he said, no, his name will be called John. So, 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 so we have to be careful. So, so when Joseph takes on the responsibility of naming this child who was not his earthly son. He took, on, he took on the responsibility for that child. This was a form of adoption. Jesus makes, uh, uh, Joseph makes a decision to adopt this child, bringing about a blended family. Y'all didn't know Jesus was adopted. He was adopted by Joseph. By naming the child, Joseph would take a responsibility for him. He was legitimizing him by giving him a name. <laughs> he made it legitimate that this child, that he was to be the earthly father of this child. And then the Bible lets us know in this context, the Bible lets us know some things.
Amen, amen. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Pray you all can see. Once again, we are just about done. Joseph made a decision about his vision. That should serve as an encouragement and a reminder for us that we also need to make a decision about the vision that the Lord has imparted unto us. Joseph takes the responsibility by naming this son accordingly and according to the vision. He brings him into his fold and under his care. And he demonstrates for us what it means to be a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. For this was Joseph's calling. It was Joseph's ministry unto the world. Joseph, in many aspects, is a figure that gets overlooked in the biblical narrative because not much is said of him other than what we read here in these few verses of Matthew. We don't hear much from Joseph. There's no great epic uh, storylines about Joseph. He didn't topple any armies or tear down any walls or perform any great miracles. He is just a man who accepted the vision and calling of the Lord, embraced his place, and received the ultimate responsibility of caring for the one who would be the savior of the world. He did a good job. He did what he was called upon the Lord to do. He fulfilled his ministry. We don't know how long he lived. We don't see his death. We know that he must have been dead by the time that Jesus was crucified because Jesus gives the care of his mother to John as opposed to entrusting him to his father. So he was, he was certainly gone and possibly for some time by that point in history. But he cared for Jesus. He cared for Emmanuel, raised him up as his own, constructing what we call today a blended family. See, friend, there are no stepchildren in the kingdom of God. This was a setting up, a foreshadowing of God's kingdom, the blending of two worlds, the blending of two families, the Jew and the Gentile. Through Jesus Christ, all are able to come to salvation. All are able to come into God's family.